So this verse from Matthew, the verses from Matthew that were read today are some of my all-time favorites as I tie in perfectly with my own story, the storms that I've faced, that I've endured in my own life, and what I've learned, just like Peter learned, when we face and when we face and endure these storms, the importance of keeping our eyes on Jesus, reaching out our hand and taking the hand of Jesus to keep us in the right direction, keep us from sinking into the sea and getting lost, keeping that faith. It is, <clears throat> it is so important. And I, I, I want to say, one thing that I have learned is that the hand we are dealt in life is never the one we envision for ourselves. But with the grace of God, it is a hand we can learn to play with love, hope, and peace. Fight, discovering God's grace is the key to utilizing the gifts and talents that God has given us you can use to become the person that God created us to be. I want to go into telling you a little bit about my story. The battles that I, the battle that I fight each day that I have fought and continue to fight each day that I think we all fight each day as we journey on the path to becoming that person that God wants us to be as we journey to take the hand of Jesus and continue. Some of you, I think, have heard some of my story, some more or less, but some of you probably haven't. Just to go back a little bit, when I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with bacterial meningitis. And for those of you who don't know what meningitis is, it's an infection in the membrane that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. Just to uh, take you back briefly to that day in 1998, or that week, the Thursday, the Thursday before I got sick, my dad was our baseball coach, and I had baseball practice, just a normal day. And then I had a fever on Friday, just a normal fever that you have when you're a kid. On Saturday, I was in the hospital in a coma. On s Sunday night, I had IVs in both arms. I had a bolt in my skull to monitor the pressure, my brain, brain pressure. I had, I had gone through multiple tests, MRIs, CAT scans. Things definitely were not looking good. About 10 days into all of this, the doctors called my parents in her family meeting and told them that I would most likely die. And if I didn't, I'd be a vegetable on a feeding tube for the rest of my life. Well, my friends, I'm, well, hopefully I'm not a vegetable. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm still here. I made it. The doctors were wrong. God had other plans for my life. But those plans, uh, some of those plans I wasn't too excited about, or I'm not too excited about, like being blind, being totally blind and hearing impaired. And when I first came home from the hospital, I was too weak to even sit up. And I, as I said, totally blind and hearing impaired. But I want, I want to take you back for a minute. When I, was in the, when I was in the hospital, I was in a coma. So obviously, you could say I, I was taking a long nap. So I don't remember any of this, any of that time. But my, my immediate family and the people closest to me definitely do. This was a very difficult time for them. But I want to take, I want to, explain, show you the power of prayer, the power of community. This church was 
incredible how they came together. They had prayer vigils weekly, daily, where people came and gathered and prayed for me day and night for my healing, for my recovery. They had teams of people who, who took care of my brother and sister while my parents were with me at the hospital, made food for my family, just took care of them. It was, it was amazing. I actually had people from over 13 countries around the world praying for me. And this was before social media, before you could send a tweet out. Incredible. My dad tells me a couple stories during this time. The first one was he, had a, uh, he has a friend, he's Jewish, and his friend went to a synagogue to pray for me. And he was, was getting ready to kneel down and pray for me when a gentleman in front of him stood up and started, started praying for me. And this was someone that he had seen before but didn't even know. And this guy was praying for me, praying for my healing. Someone that didn't even know me. That's the power, the intercession, the power of prayer at work. Another story he tells me from when I was, this is when I was in the intensive care where the sickest kids are in the hospital. It was his turn to stay with me at the hospital that night. My mom called him and told him that three women from, from my little league wanted to come to the hospital and pray for me. My dad said, okay. Well, the women didn't end, end up showing up until about 11 o'clock at night at the hospital. And my dad wasn't sure if they would be able to go see me because it was so late. So he went and asked the nurse. And <clears throat> gratefully, the nurse was a Christian herself. And she said, okay, that's totally fine. Let them in as long as they don't mind me coming in and out to adjust Drew's IV. These women were in my, at my bedside praying for me for f over four hours. It was incredible, and it's no accident, no coincidence that around this time was when my body, my kidneys, started working for themselves again. And I guess you could say my recovery started the power of prayer, the power of community. There are so many people supporting my family, as I said, praying for me. This church was an incredible place, an incredible body of Christ. When I finally woke up from the coma, after three long months, it is not like you see in the movies. I woke up from the coma. I, I wish it was, actually, I wish it was like you see in the movies where I just would jump out of bed and say, oh my gosh, mom and dad, what the heck happened while I was asleep? Oh, well, unfortunately, it wasn't like that. Coming out of a three-month coma was like waking up from a deep, deep fog. It actually took me a full month to realize what had happened. I was in denial. My parents and the nurses were trying to gently let me know what was going on, but I refused to accept it. I was visualizing my bedroom, even though I was totally blind. I went, and, and finally, after that month, I came to terms and it was, it hit me very hard. When I came home from the hospital, I was too weak, as I mentioned before, to even sit up, totally blind, hearing impaired. I had to move my bed, my bedroom downstairs because I couldn't navigate the stairs. And I brought one of those fancy hospital beds home that you can move up and down with the push of a button. 
And that was my sole entertainment for a very long time. Pretty exciting, huh? Well, I would lie in bed not knowing what to do. It was so frustrating. During this time also, since I couldn't navigate the stairs, I had a special wheelchair that I would take out into the backyard. And that's where I took my showers. We'd hook a, the garden hose through the kitchen window up to the kitchen sink because I do like my hot water when I take showers. <laughs> and that, I mean, it was frustrating, but there was nothing I could do about it. It was just the way it was. I had night after night where I lie in bed just crying out to God, what am I supposed to do with my life? I'm totally blind. I'm here in a beard. I can't even sit up. What the heck is left for me? Well, I'd go to bed with tears streaming down my face only to wake up in the morning somehow with a new, renewed spirit, a renewed purpose. I had no clue what that purpose was, what the heck I was supposed to do with my life, only that God wasn't done with me yet. God still had a plan for my life. He, there was still a reason why I was alive. And that kept me going. I believe that. And of course, my, my friends and family supported that. The church and the community, as I've said so many times, kept me going. And re reaching out for the hand of God Keeping my eyes on God. That is so important. I'm going to keep repeating that because that's, that's just like Peter. When he, was, when he started walking towards Jesus and he started sinking because he took his eyes off God, he's lost faith. He got scared. It's so easy to do, so easy just to say that. But it's not easy in reality to live that, but it does work. It really does. Well, moving on, fast forward now to 2016, to the present day. And this is still the same, same thing. I'm reaching out. We all need to reach out for that hand of Jesus. Take the hand of Jesus. Let him guide us because He's our ultimate light. I like to say that metaphorically, all of us are journeying blind in life because we can't see. We can't see into the future. We can't see what's coming next. We just have to trust, have faith in Jesus that it's gonna work out, that when we keep our eyes on him, that the best is yet to come. But as we move forward, I wanna briefly share with you an acronym that I came up with. I call it my angel. A stands for attitude. When you wake up in the morning, you have a choice to make. What kind of day do you wanna have? Do you wanna have a day filled with promise? Or do you wanna have a day dictated by regret and excuses. It's really up to you, and it depends on your attitude. It's a choice. The next letter is N. It's for no excuses. And I'm the no excuses blind guy. It's kind of my title. So this is, I guess you could say, this is my forte letter. But we all make excuses at one time or another, don't we? We say things like, I'm too old. I'm not smart enough, I'm too short, I'm too fat, I'm disabled. Or maybe we might even say, I just don't have what it takes. Well, my friends, when we make excuses, all it does, it just holds us back. It holds us back from achieving, from becoming the person that God created us to be. I wanna tell you a story that some of you might have seen 
if you're friends with me on Facebook. But recently, I had the opportunity to, that's a process that's taken a couple years to get a guide dog. And you go through a huge application process, medical applications, all, all those things, and I finally, finally got approved, and they finally found me a dog. Well, the trainer brought out the dog, a golden, I mean, a yellow lap, beautiful dog named Rudy. He brought the dog over. We started my training, and it was, it was great. I learned, we did obedience training, walking around in the neighborhood. I learned, I learned what it's like to, to live with a dog because the dog slept next to my bed each day. It was amazing, but towards the end of the training, my, the trainer and I just, uh, decided, we, know, we saw that I didn't really have the orientation and mobility skills that it took to really utilize a guide dog. It was so frustrating because I had trained with this dog for eight days, fell in love with this dog. So I don't have this dog anymore. The trainer has to take him back. I, there were was, there was many, th- many ways I could have responded to that. I could have just <sighs> given up, getting angry. I could have blamed the guide dog, Rudy. Why didn't he do better? Or, or blame the trainer. He didn't train me the right way. Or I could have blamed God. Why the heck did you make me become blind. Why the heck am I disabled? It's not fair. I could have said all those things, but I didn't. Instead, I chose to be grateful. Grateful for the opportunity I had to meet this dog, to meet Rudy, to spend those eight days with Rudy. Because it was a great eight days. I learned from those eight days that I love dog. I love spending time with dogs, caring for a dog, feeding a dog, taking the dog out to walk, even picking up Rudy's poop. I enjoyed all of it, and I encourage you guys. Any of you who have a dog, it, it, it's fun. Next time you go out to pick up your dog's poop, put a blindfold on. <laughs> That's, a, that's, that's what I do. It's, it, it's, it's kind of fun. It's kind of, oh, so where is that landfill? I don't want to stamp in it. <laughs> uh, but seriously, it was, it was the experience, such a positive experience, even though I don't have a dog now. I know what I needed to do. I need to improve my mobility and orientation skills to get the dog if the dog is right for me, I, I, can ex- I still have the opportunity to explore it in a couple months. So don't give up. Don't make excuses. It's only going to hold you back and keep you from becoming the person that God created you, created you to be. The next letter in my angel is G for gratitude. Gratitude is so important. Gratitude, I guess... It's a foundation, I think, for all of these things. Being grateful. Waking up with a grateful heart. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but when you are truly grateful, it is impossible to be sad. They're just opposite emotions. You can't do the same thing, those two things at the same time. I encourage you to try it for yourself. Try to be sad and truly grateful at the same time. See what happens. The next letter, my angel, is E for exercise. There's mental and there's physical exercise. We need to take care of our bodies. Our bodies are temples of God. We need to take care of our bodies. Exercise, eat right. Same with our minds. We need to exercise our minds whether it's reading, whatever it is, whatever you like to do, we, we need to keep those things active. I don't know, some of you guys might think I'm crazy, but recently I decided to 
Try something different. Take on a new endeavor, I guess you could say. I, this coming October, I started training for a triathlon that I'm going to compete in. It's with the Challenged Athletes Foundation, which is an organization in San Diego. And it's, <clears throat> it's going to be a one-mile swim, a 44-mile bike ride, and a 10K run. And I'm very, very excited about it. I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm training for it. It's, it's definitely, especially the running, which I'm not, I'm not a runner. So I have to, definitely have to train for it. And, and, and also, if, if, if you think of a triathlon, I mean, obviously, you guys have never done a blind so you, you don't know, I, I, could be, I could get out there and start running in circles, riding my bike in circles, swimming in circles. Oh, well, luckily, I have a guide. I'm doing it with somebody. So it's not going to be riding in circles, because that, that, that would be more like a 600-mile run and a 1,000-mile <laughs> bike ride. <laughs> but no, I, I have an, um, this amazing guy who I met... Uh, a few weeks ago in San Diego, he's going to be doing it with me. He's an incredible athlete, and I'm really, really excited. And it's, it, it is a fundraiser for the Challenge Athletes Foundation, but also for a few pieces of specialized equipment that I need to purchase in order to, to participate in this triathlon. And hopefully, if... I don't, if I survive it, I might, I might continue to do some more triathlons as well. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be out with my dad uh, after the service at the welcome table. I definitely want to talk to you guys. Uh, but also, if you want to make a donation for the triathlon to me and to the Challenge Athletes Foundation, I'd really, really appreciate it. And it Financial donations are, of course, greatly appreciated, but also I think I need your prayers as well for my, for my well-being during this whole process. Thanks so much. Last letter in my angel is L, for love yourselves. It's so important to love yourselves just as God loves us. We are created in God's image and if you, we don't, if you don't love your first, love yourselves, how can you be a good friend, a good spouse, a good sibling, any of that? You can't if you don't know how to first love yourselves. And I'm not talking about conceited love, but just knowing that you have what it takes to be all that you can be. Also, connected to loving yourselves I like to think that forgiveness goes, goes along with that. Because if you cannot forgive yourself or forgive others, how, it, it's like someone once told me, living in unforgiveness is like taking poison and expecting the other person to get sick. I mean, that's, that's one, of the, one of those kind of brain teasers you have to think about for a while. But right off the bat, it kind of makes sense if you don't think about it for a while. And it's, but it's true that living in unforgiveness harms yourself. Harboring that, not letting it go, is like you stay sick. But when, when you can, and letting, forgiving others, forgiving yourself, it doesn't, it doesn't mean, it's not the same as forgetting. It just means you're letting go. You're forgiving, freeing yourself up as well as others. Very important. My friends, we all face challenges in life, don't we? Some of us more, some of us more than others. We, we need to hold that hand of Jesus, keep our eyes on Jesus so we can go in in the right direction. And by the way, that, that, that's what I'm planning to do with, with my triathlon. I, I guess I don't really need a guide. <laughs> but 
we, we need to keep our eyes in the right direction so we can get there. We, don't, we won't sink in to the sea like Peter started to do. We can, we can figuratively walk on water. It is incredible. And also, when we can do that, when you can do that, only the best is yet to come. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this awesome opportunity I've had today to share my testimony, share my story, my message, inspiration with everybody here. It is so important, Lord. Please help us to focus on you, to hold your hand every step of the way. Keep our eyes on you because it's, it's the only way we're going to be ultimately successful in life, Lord. We all know it. Please guide us every step of the way. Thank you so much. We pray this. And you press this holy name. Amen.